We're talking art today on Aprender Inglés con Resi Craig. What's the difference between to sculpt and to carve? What is bronze, brass and copper? Find out on this week's episode and take your vocabulary to the next level on Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Hi, Craig. How are things? Pretty good. Thank you, Reza. If you're a new listener to the show, welcome. With over 45 years of teaching between us, Reza and I are going to help you take your English to the next level. How are you, Reza? I'm very well, Craig, I must say. And you? Yep, feeling good. Thank you very much. Shall we get down to business? Do we have any feedback this week, Reza? Yep, let's start off with a voice message. This is Alex from London. Hey guys, how you doing? This is Alex from London. Uh, first of all, guys, I want to thank you for being really helpful and supportive. Uh, you make an incredible effort and I'm not sure whether you realize or not how many people you do help uh, making this podcast, guys. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, I just listened uh, to your last podcast, uh, the, the one talking about sex, and I really enjoyed um, the new female voice. Um, her, I think her accent was really clear, really understandable. And I wish everyone um, uh, spoke like that here in London. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I think um, I would like to uh, hear more from her next time, guys. Um, so that's it, guys. Time to say goodbye. Thank you again. Um, keep doing like that, please. I'm looking forward to hear from you, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> And thank you, Alex, for taking the time to send us that message. Thanks very much. Yeah, speaking of very clear pronunciation, uh, I thought Alex spoke very, very well. Yes, really very, good pronunciation. Very understandable. And we agree with you. Um, it was lovely having Bay on the show as ever. It's not the first time she was on the show. And she's always extremely popular. Yeah, she is. And I wish she'd come on the show a bit more. It's uh, not easy to get her to come over to my flat and record with Reza and I because we all teach at the same school, we have different timetables, but she did say she'd love to come back on the show soon, so we'll try to get her to come back in the new year. So I agree, Alex, let's bring back Bea. And as Alex pointed out, Bea has the kind of lovely voice which foreigners think they're going to get in London, <laughs> but then they <laughs> arrive in London. And first of all, they discover that half of London is not English and not a native English speaker. Yeah. And then the other half are a real mixture of accents from all over the place. That's right. Yeah. There's just one thing, Alex, that I'd like to improve on your message. You said, keep doing like that. Perhaps it will be an improvement to say, keep up the good work. The phrasal verb to keep up means continue. So keep up with the good work or keep up the good work is a nice, a nice expression. If any other listeners would like to express their satisfaction on our episode about sex, please feel free to, to drop us a message. And if you haven't heard that episode yet, go to inglespodcast.com slash 183. That was the episode on sex with Bea. Yeah. Satisfaction guaranteed. We also have a new review on iTunes, so thank you very much to Huesos Cero Cuatro for the five-star review and the comment. Succum su su Why don't you read it, Reza? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks for your comment, which reads, Se ha convertido en mi compañero de viaje cada día cuando voy al trabajo mientras conduzco. Wow, thank you very much. He says it's a great way to take advantage of dead time. Yeah, Pilar in France, one of our new patrons, she also said that, that she listens in the car, um, which is a great way, of course, to multitask. So while you're walking the dog, in the gym, doing the shopping or the cooking, cleaning the flat, whatever you're doing that doesn't really need 100% attention, why not listen to our podcast and improve your English? And in fact, we have more feedback from another Pilar 
This one from Sevilla. There's an awful lot of Pilars listening to our podcast, you know. There's a lot of them about. This one's from Sevilla. Pilar from Sevilla. She writes, Hi, Reza and Craig. I usually listen to your podcast while I'm walking to work. There you and, go. Yeah. Yeah, you see? And it's a great help to improve my English because at the moment, it's very difficult for me to attend classes due to my work schedule. I'm currently working on cultural issues for the Seville, that's Sevilla in English, Seville City Council. And I want to propose you a podcast, hmm, um, Pilar, better to say suggest a podcast topic about art and specific art vocabulary, especially in painting and architecture. As you know, Seville has a huge historical heritage with many churches, convents, the cathedral, and so on. My challenge is to be able to explain them properly as well as paintings, which we can find on theirs walls. She said, mm, theirs, no, their, because adjectives don't have a plural S in English, their wall. Regards, Pilar. Mm, thanks. thanks very much, Pilar. Thank you very much, Pilar. Yeah, perhaps we'll do a special episode in the future only on architecture, but let's look at painting today and painting in general and also how it refers to uh, to buildings and works of art that maybe will be useful for Pilar. What's the difference, Reza, between painting and drawing? Yes, just so you remember the words in English, painting is wet. I'm simplifying things, but more or less, it's wet. It requires paint. Painting requires paint. Whereas drawing is dry. You use pencils, lapiceros, or pens, bolis, etc. That's the type of thing for drawing. To help you remember, think draw, dry. They kind of sound similar. Draw, dibujar, dry, seco. And then you remember, ah, okay, dibujar, draw, draw, dry. And paint, wet. And the verb to draw is spelled D-R-A-W, and it's the same spelling as the noun, which is uh, cajon. Ah, right, exactly. Yeah. Draws. Now, um, just to clarify some very basic uh, vocabulary first, which can cause confusion, painting as a, a hobby or an interest or a profession, painting is la pintura, and it requires you to, to stain, S-T-A-I-N, that's manchar, or smudge, S-M-U-D-G-E, that's borronear, hacer un borrón. Or smear, S-M-E-A-R, that's correr, with paint. So those are the typical techniques for painting. There, there are others, but they are the basics. And you use different colors of paint to produce the finished painting, la pintura o el cuadro. So the word painting can be the, the topic or the subject in general, or it can be a specific cuadro. That can also be a painting, the work of art. And you do this using a brush, that's un pincel. So I could say I really like painting, means I like the activity of painting. And hey, look at that beautiful painting on the wall. So you could use the the gerund form for the noun that way. What about drawing, Craig? Well, drawing can be done with many different tools. So you could use uh, pencils, for example, lapiceros. You could use pens, bolígrafos, crowns, C-R-A-Y-O-N-S, ferras. I think crowns usually have wax in them, don't they? I remember when I was a kid, I used to draw with wax crowns mm -hmm. and wax is in fact cera as well but yeah. in english we use a different word when you use the wax as a pen then we call it a crayon um you can use pastels which is very similar in spanish you can draw with pastel colors uh crowns as i said and markers m-a-r-k-e-r-s which are rotuladores in spanish or you could use felt tip pens rotuladores but rotulador is pequeños. Ah, right. Yeah. It's the same word in Spanish, but uh, markers are used by teachers, for example, to write on whiteboards, but you couldn't use a felt tip pen for that. It's too small. Mm -hmm. A felt tip pen looks similar, but it's used on, on paper and things like that. You could also use chalk, tiza, tithas, chalks, and charcoals. So you could have a charcoal drawing, and charcoal is carboncillos. 
One of the things you might draw could be a sketch. A sketch. So if you like sketching, boceto, you kind of draw things quickly without too much detail, right? Think yeah. of sketching as, as a quick thing, right? Yeah, very quick sketch. Sometimes you walk along the um, the Paseo here at the beach, you walk along the, the broad walk, or if you walk in, uh, in around Barcelona in the tourist areas, you're going to see sketch artists drawing people's faces. So they're making a quick sketch of someone's face, usually a cartoon sketch. Oh, yes. Um, painting on the wall is pintura al fresco, or you could say un fresco or un mural. Another type of very common painting is a portrait. That's P-O-R-T-R-A-I-T. Portrait, un retrato. In other words, a person. So you could um, paint a portrait of a person, or if you paint something that doesn't move, typically a bowl of fruit or a vase of flowers, that's called a still life painting. And that's easy to remember because it's life that is still. It doesn't move. It's a still life painting. Bodegones in Spanish. The typical material that you paint on uh, of many artists, although, of course, these days people experiment with all sorts of things, but canvas is the most typical material. That's lienzo or tela, canvas, C-A-N-V-A-S, canvas. And another useful vocabulary to describe painting is the brush strokes that the artist uses, penceladas, the brush strokes. You could have very thick brush strokes, very fine brush strokes. So it describes the way the painter uses the brush. You remember we said brush earlier is pincel, and stroke is a slow, soft movement. Like you can stroke a dog or mm -hmm. a cat if you um, move your hand slowly across a dog. You could no. stroke a person. Stroke, stroke a person as well. Ho hold on, Craig. Let's let's <laughs> not down. get carried away. We we covered that in the episode on, on sex. sex. Yes. <laughs> so stroke is movement of hand. So a brush stroke is taking the brush and moving it. One very popular form of art is ceramics with an s which i'm exaggerating ceramics or pottery that's la ceramica in spanish it's singular but in english it's always got that plural s you can uh, fire your ceramic pot or other ornament which you make the pot is um, a, a container made in a kiln or fired because you need fire it's fired in a kiln, K-I-L-N. That's a very hot oven used by potters, the people who make pots and things like that. And they have to make a very hot oven and put it in and fire it very quick so mm -hmm. that it stays hard. At a very high temperature. The material they use to make these ceramics is called clay in English, barro. So C-L-A-Y. So you get clay pots and clay dishes and cups and ashtrays of course in seville and in many other places in spain and around the world uh, religious art's very important and and a useful word to talk about religious art might be an altar piece so the altar is el altar so an altar piece is un retablo and as you're walking around museums and uh, cities, you'll probably see a few sculptures. Now, sculptures, a difficult word to pronounce. The spelling is S-C-U-L-P-T-U-R-E. Now, because I'm from London, I'd probably say sculpture. So the schwa, the uh at the end, sculpture. How would you pronounce it, Reza? Yeah, being from Belfast, we exaggerate the R a bit more. So I'd say sculpture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I prefer the way you say it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Craig might prefer it, but his way is closer to what you'll find in the in the Oxford Dictionary. So, sculpt. <clears throat> well, where's Bea when you need her? We need Bea with yeah. her come, her R P pronunciation. Come back, Bea, and tell us how to say sculpture. <laughs> so, the noun is sculpture. So, you see sculptures in museums and around cities. The verb is to sculpt. S C U L P T. So, to sculpt 
a sculpture. And the person who does that, the name of the person is a sculptor. S-C-U-L-P-T-O-R. Remember, you can see all the spellings and see the list of this vocabulary over at inglespodcast.com slash 188. It's particularly hard to hear the difference between the person, sculptor, and the object or the art form, sculpture. Because yeah. um, the only difference really is th- that the person is t sound, mm-hmm. sculptor, but the object is a ch sound, sculpture. What's really interesting is that the ch is usually made with ch, like church or chimney, but here it's U-L-P-T-U-R-E, sculpture. And a sculpture stands in a place. We use the verb to stand like people stand when when they're on two feet and uh, vertical. We also say a sculpture stands in a place. For example, the ceramic figure stands in the main square, you could say. So one way of creating a sculpture is to sculpt it. Um, There's also another verb which is commonly used with wood, madera, and that's to carve. So you carve wood, tallar. Or el scopir, you could say in Spanish. So you can have a wooden carving of an image, a wooden carving of a saint or a wooden carving of a tree, for example. The person who does the carving is a carver, so a wood carver. And carver, some of you may have noticed, is a very common surname because just like Spanish, many surnames in English come from old jobs, old professions. So you might meet someone called Mr. or Ms. Carver. And for wood, uh, madera, uh, as you know, if you make things out of wood, you're a carpenter, which is also a very common name in English. Yep. And the verb to carve, obviously here we're speaking about art, but you could also use it to speak about food. You can carve the turkey at Christmas. You can carve the meat which means to cut it into pieces. I wonder if all countries in the world are similar to to Britain and Ireland. When it comes to carving meat, traditionally in this sexist world, that's the man's job at Christmas, isn't it? It's, the Christmas turkey is carved by the man. It's typical. It's the, It's usually the woman who's slaving and working hard all morning in the kitchen, creating a lovely meal. But it's the man who gets the honour when he carves the turkey at the table. Yeah, very sexist. Very unfair. It, it's a bit like the paella. Yeah, in in Valencia here, uh, I imagine housewives do most of the cooking, but the paella, oh, that's for the men. That's that's special. The man has to do that. So we spoke about wood for carvings, but of course there is many material that you could use to create art. You can sculpt or carve different things. So marble is very expensive, but very common for statues. Marmol. In Spanish, marble, M-A-R-B-L-E. So a marble statue. Bronze, bronce, bronze, B-R-O-N-Z-E, is another useful material. And another useful metal is brass. That's laton. We had that last week with brass monkeys when we spoke about the weather. So. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is again, brass, laton, brass uh, sculpture. A a material which I imagine must be very difficult to work with is cast iron, hierro fundido. So iron, hierro, and cast fundido. To cast, fundir, is an irregular verb. Cast, cast, cast. So fundido, cast. It's very common with doors, isn't it? A cast iron door, for example, you might hear that. Uh, Copper. C O W P E R is slang for a policeman, but in this co- in this content context, it's cobre, so copper, copper statue, copper copper ornament, for example. Another common material for for sculpture is stone. S T O N E, piedra. If you say a stone, then you're making it countable. That's una piedra, but you can also talk about piedra as the material stone. Plaster. Now, not not a plaster, <laughs> not countable this time, just plaster, uncountable, is yeso. Um, but there's another type of plaster, Craig. What's the other type? Yeah, if you break your leg or break your arm, you'll go to the hospital and they'll give you um, a plaster cast. Now, that's escayola in Spanish. So you can have your leg in plaster if you break it 
or they put your arm in plaster if you if you break your arm one comment that the, with this material like plaster wood marble it's usually uncountable when you're speaking about the material but it becomes countable and sometimes has a different meaning if you use an article as Reza said so you can have plaster the material and a plaster Craig have you ever been plastered many 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 times especially when I was younger if you are plastered you're very very drunk yep he's absolutely plastered he's completely drunk Whereas if you have escayola plaster on your leg, you say you are in plaster, mm -hmm. not plastered. Craig, have you been to any art exhibition lately? That's exposition. I haven't been to an art exhibition for quite a few years. Of course, that's a common collocation. Exhibition goes with art to collocate. And in Spanish, exposición. Have you been to one recently? Any art ex exhibitions? No, not in a while. I might do that at Christmas when I have a bit of free time. That's something I like to do. I'll see what they what they display or what they exhibit. That's the verb. Display or exhibit is exponer. They can also be nouns. You can say a display or an exhibit, exposition. And uh, as well as collocating with exhibition, art, art exhibition, it also collocates with gallery, of course. So an art gallery, galleria d'arte. And in that gallery, what you might see is fine arts. That's bellas artes, fine arts in English. And I couldn't do this podcast on art without saying a quick hello to my good friend Bea, who is uh, Beatriz Esteban on Twitter. And I asked her about any particular vocabulary she's curious about because Bea is a, an artist and a sculptor. And she asked me about the following words, bastidor in Spanish. What's that? That's a stretcher, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a frame, um, a frame or marco for stretching canvas. So before you start to paint on canvas, I think you soak it, which means you put it in water for a long time, and then you have to stretch it. To stretch is estirar, alongar, and you do that on a stretcher. So a stretcher can be camilla if you break your leg. You're probably carried on a stretcher. But in art, it's the frame that you use to stretch the canvas. We already mentioned pincelada, which Betty asked about, which is a, a brush stroke. And it's very common to talk about um, to add the final touch, which is dar la última pincelada in Spanish, or dar el toque final, to add the final touch. But that doesn't necessarily need to be connected to art. If you're cooking a meal, for example, maybe the final touch is uh, some herbs on the top of the food, or the cherry on the top of the cake. That adds the final touch. Or the icing on the cake, maybe. Yep. Which is la guinda in Spanish, isn't it? The mm -hmm. icing on the cake might be the final touch. And Bear also mentioned degradado or degradar, which is very similar in English to degrade or to deteriorate. That's got quite a few syllables, hasn't it? Deteriorate, deteriorate, which means to get worse. Yes. Some of you listeners who have been listening for a long time might have noticed that my, my jokes have degraded over time. They've got worse. No, they've, they've always got, been bad. They've always that? been bad, yeah. but they've gone from bad to worse. My Spanish Terrible. has deteriorated since, uh, since I've been doing this podcast. I think my Spanish is much worse. You could also use um, the expression with varnish. Varnish. So the varnish has deteriorated over time. If you have very old furniture, for example, then maybe the paint or the varnish deteriorates over the years. Now, if you're going to paint on canvas, you'll need to set the canvas somewhere, put it somewhere, and you'll need an easel for that. That's E-A-S-E-L. Easel. El cabillete del pintor, or a painter's easel. That's easy to remember because it's similar to easy. So an easel makes it easy for the painter to paint the picture. And also chisel, which in Spanish is cincel. So the chisel is something Bea uses when she's sculpting chisel, C-H-I-S-E-L, which is a word we didn't mention 
during the episode on uh, tools for do it yourself and DIY. So you could use a chisel to um, shape wood for DIY as well. Yeah, or indeed for other things such as stone as well. In fact, thinking about it, Craig, quite a few of an artist's tools can also be used as DIY tools. Yes. Sculpture uh, particularly requires the use of chisels, hammers. Hammer and chisel. um, Saws, sierras, all that type of thing. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Craig, have you got a favourite artist? Um... I've always liked Van Gogh and other similar impressionists, um, Monet as well, and Degas and Cezanne. But Van Gogh in particular, possibly because he had such a tormented life and his his story is well known. And I've seen some of his pictures in Amsterdam, some of his paintings, and they're beautiful to see them, like to stand there and look at them. They're just amazing. The style that I really, really like, I find it attractive. Now, there's a place I'd like to visit to see the art, Amsterdam. I, I envy you, mm-hmm. the, the envidio. Amsterdam said to be one of the best cities in the world to see fine art. It's got some great art galleries, some wonderful places and museums. Have, but, you, got, have you got a favourite artist? I don't really know. No, I haven't got very fixed tastes in art. I'm quite capricious, quite capricious. Though I remember visiting El Prado in Madrid, another amazing city, if you want to see good art. Yeah. And um, being really, really uh, overwhelmed by the sheer quality what does, and what quantity. What does overwhelmed mean? Overwhelmed means difficult to absorb all the information, difficult to accept that it could really be true. Mm-hmm. There's just so much amazing art from you know, Picasso to Velázquez to anybody you can think of, that I was just, you know, absolutely amazed. I think that's one of the problems I have with art galleries and museums is that because I don't know enough about art when I go there, I enjoy it for the first 10 minutes and then there's so much to see and you, you're you looking at painting after painting and after a while I, I stop seeing what I'm looking at. Does that make sense? Yeah. I stop appreciating it because I'm just going from painting to painting to painting and not really absorbing, not taking in the beauty of the work. I know there are some people who know what they're doing and they go to galleries or museums or other places where they might have art and they might look at just one work of art. That's mm-hmm. it. They go in only to see that one work of art or or two or three and Look at it for an hour or two and really, really appreciate it. I'd yeah. like to try that someday. Yeah, look at the brush strokes and uh, the colours and everything. What's the most money you've ever spent on a piece of art? Have you ever bought art? Yes, not very much, to be honest. Probably about, I think about 30 euros I once spent on something. And it was only because a friend of mine had done it. And I kind of wanted to support support them a little bit, so I, b- I bought it. What about you? This is very, very similar, actually. Not a painting, but I had a girlfriend who was from Russia, and she used to buy clay pots and vases and then paint them and sell them in a market. So again, to support her, and also because they were very, very nice, she painted really, really well. And I think I bought one from her for a similar price, actually, about 30 or $40, um, like I think it was a vase for flowers. Do you think art's overpriced? Um, well, I don't know. I know it's a good investment if you know what you're buying, but I think things have the value of what people are prepared to pay for them. I think anything, nothing can be overpriced if there's a market for it and people are prepared to pay the money. What do you think? Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I wouldn't be prepared to pay some of the very large sums that people Me neither. pay. Me but, neither. but there are people who are prepared to pay it. So I guess you're right. Craig, what do you think about some um, controversial, controvertido, controversial modern art? I'm talking about uh, works like Damien Hirst's 
like his mother and child divided, which shows a bisected cow, that's a cow cut in half, and the calf, the baby cow, preserved in tanks. They really are animals. They're real, mm -hmm. but they've been cut in half and put in tanks. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes so people can have a look if they want on internet. What do you think of that type of art? It sounds disgusting to me, but I don't think there is good or bad art. And I don't think there is good or bad music. I think there's just art that you like and art that you don't like. So uh, obviously people like it, but I don't think I have the right to say it's not good art just because I don't like it, because it doesn't appeal to me. And I think it's the same with music. So yeah, I can say what I like and what I don't like. Personally, everybody can, but I don't think anybody has the right to, to, to say that it's bad or good. But does anybody have the right to question it morally? Not the standard of art, but to say, mm, for example, it's not right to be displaying a dead corpse for years and years and years for amusement. What about that? Not sure. It's what if it was the dead corpse of a human mother and her child? Would you not find that really bad taste to be on display? I think as long as the f as long as it's not causing offence and nobody is being hurt by it emotionally, then everybody has the choice of going to see it or not going to see it. It's a bit like an offensive film. I think you either watch it or you don't watch it. And as long as nobody's being hurt by it, I don't see the problem. Personally, I would not go and see it, and I certainly wouldn't pay money to see it. But Perhaps people would, and if they want to, why not? Have you got a favourite style of art? I mentioned the Impressionists before, and there are many, aren't there? There are many different schools of art and kinds of art. There's realism, surrealism, expressionism, impressionism, cubism, futurism. There's abstract art and art nouveau, art deco. There's dada, pop art, digital art. Installation art is another one. There are so many so do you have a favourite um, style of art? No, I don't. But I think my tastes change depending on my age. I know that when I was in my late teens and early 20s, I was very interested in the Spanish artist uh, Dali. I thought he was very interested in that whole surrealist movement. I thought that some of his work was very, very funny, very amusing, but quite profound at the same time. But now it doesn't quite attract me so much. Maybe my tastes have changed. They become a bit more conservative or, or just different. What mm -hmm. about you? Well, as I said before, yeah, I've always admired the Impressionists. And sometimes I don't know enough about art to look at it critically. I think you have to kind of study art and read about it and learn about it to really appreciate it properly. But sometimes I'll be in an office or a house or maybe a gallery and I'll see a painting that I really, really like and I don't know why. It could be a combination of colours or it could be a combination of shapes. It might be modern or some other style of art. But I say, oh yeah, I really like that, but I don't know why. So that happens occasionally. But I wish I knew more about art. I really do. Are you interested in digital art? Yes. Yeah, I've been to a couple of uh, digital exhibitions and that really interests me, especially with light and sound. I've been to a few light and sound exhibitions and that's amazing. Do you like kind of avant-garde? That's vanguard, vanguardia. Do you like avant-garde? That's a French word, A-V-A-N-T hyphen, Guillaume. G-A-R-D-E. Do you like avant-garde art? I prefer minimalism. I like very minimal things and sparse use of colour. Sparse means muy poco. So using very subtle changes, but n not a very crowded picture, not a very crowded scene. What about you? Mm, I, I can't I can't be exact, Craig. I'm, I'm afraid I'm too too capricious. I don't I don't really have a fixed style that I like. So, these so you're days. a bit like me then. You see a painting, you really like it, and it could be any style in any could be period. There's some impressionist paintings I've seen, like of Turner, the the British artist that I've really liked. Oh, oh, is it Monet? Yeah, I think it's Monet. Or there, I can, I can, I can two, use Monet and Manet. Monet and Manet. Monet was the was the um the impressionist who yeah. created like he was very prolific, which means he created lots and lots of art. And painted lots of things. I think one of his famous pieces is Water Lilies. Right. 
And that's Monet, M-O-N-E-T. The other one's Manet, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's Monet. Yeah, I saw one of his works which blew my mind, uh, an impressionist uh, piece of art. It was in Rouen in France. Uh, if, if Pilar from France is listening, maybe she's seen it. I think it was of the cathedral or a church in Rouen. Mm -hmm. And if you go right up close to it, you, you can't make any sense out of it at all. It doesn't look like anything. You have to go back. You start walking back, yeah, backwards, I mean, not forwards, backwards. And you have to get to about three or four meters before you see it. Because it's composed Trail. of tiny dots. Tiny dots. The brush yeah. strokes are very, very small. Yeah. You, it, it's senseless when you're up close and you go back and then you see it perfectly. It really blew my mind. It was amazing. Have you seen the Mona Lisa? No. I've never been to Le Louvre and I've never seen the Mona Lisa. Have mm. you? Yeah. Yeah. It's impressive. It, it lives up to its reputation. I mean, you, you stare at it, you look at it, you realize mm. you're in front of a masterpiece and uh, you are trying to see if she's smiling or she's not smiling. And yeah, it's a beautiful piece of art. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you very much for listening to us. And now it's your turn to practice your English. What's your opinion on art? Do you have a favorite artist or period or style of art? Or maybe you have a question for us or an idea for a future episode. Send us a voice message and tell us what you think. You can do that on SpeakPipe. That's speakpipe.com slash Inglés podcast. As usual, the show notes for this episode on the website at inglespodcast.com slash 188. And if you want to send us an email, my address is craig at inglespodcast.com. And mine's belfastreza at the gmail.com. For more show notes, go to patreon.com slash Inglés podcast. And why not join us, our Patreon program, and become one of our lovely Patreon sponsors. Huge thanks to Bruno, our gold Patreon, who does walking tours of Copenhagen through his company, Copenhagen Walking Tour. Dot com. The link to that also in the show notes. If you're interested in knowing Copenhagen and you're visiting there soon, why not get in touch with Bruno? And he's offering a 10% discount for listeners of the show. If you're an alcoholic like Bruno, get in touch with him and he will supply a professional city guide, a local guide who can show you the city and you'll get 10% off the price. And as well as Copenhagen, he's also doing a, a walking tour of the favela in Rio. The favela, like the the very famous uh, poor area outside the city. Yeah, I'd like to do that. If I ever go to Rio, I will definitely get in touch with Bruno to to show, get him onto one of his professional guides to show me the favela. That would be really, really interesting. And for more information of Bruno's walking tour in Rio, go to favelawalkingtour.com. Dot br and that link will also be in the show notes and that's also 10 percent discount and also a big thanks to all our other sponsors who are beatriz pedro maite lara rafa nestor garcia manez at nestorgm.com luces extrañas podcast maria gervati lorena sarajarabo Carlos Mamen, Juan, Cory Finneran from IVMV.com, Miren, José Luis, Agus, Mariel, Manuel, Jorge, Raúl, Rafael, Manuel, Tarazona, José Manuel, Juan Carlos, Pilar, Ganbate Blog, and our latest patrons, Ana Giovanna and Igor Garmendia, and of course our gold sponsor Bruno from CopenhagenWalkingTour.com. Also thanks to Patricia Alonso, who, as you know, if you're a regular listener, has been working very hard to transcribe episodes for you so you can read them. And we now have episodes 1 to 11 and 131 to 142 fully transcribed so you can read those notes. And if you want more, um, more than that, so more transcriptions, join our Patreon program for just $1 per month and you get instant access to recent transcriptions lovingly translated by Angelica Bello from Madrid. And again, that's at patri patreon.com slash English podcast. What's next week, Reza? On next week's episode, Butcher vocabulary. Yes, we're talking meat next week, so, so join us then. And until then, it's goodbye from me. And bye-bye from me. 
The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later.